leaves are made completely of carbon and that's what you're going to want to do that reading for and again the reading from the book will help you fill out some information about those things but we're moving on to intramolecular forces so first of all what are intramolecular forces those are the forces that exist within molecules in other words intramolecular forces are bonds So what three types of bonds do we have? Go ahead. Pure covalent is one of them, absolutely. Oh, except that it's not letting me write. Try this again. Okay, pure covalent. Ionic. Okay, well, you can write it down because we just talked about it. Ionic, yep. What's our third one? Polar. Polar covalent. Thank you. So all three of these are bonds. They're the only bonds that we're going to talk about. And they're existing within molecules intramolecular. Well, next we're going to talk about what holds all of these molecules and these bonded ionic substances close to one another. Because in the normal world as we're thinking about things, if we just had atoms and molecules that were not being held together by some forces, we wouldn't exist. We'd have atoms and molecules all far away and they wouldn't be joining near one another. And that's what we call intermolecular forces. So intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. So it's what's holding our water in our cup. Holding all of those water molecules near one another. It's not the actual bonds. It's just what's holding different molecules near to one another. We have different types of intermolecular forces. We have dipole-dipole, hydrogen, and London dispersion, which is also called Van der Waals. Mm -hmm. And these are weaker forces than bonds. So the force is not great enough to form an actual bond between atoms or molecules, making them bigger. It's just holding different molecules near to one another so they don't go out as far away from another, each other as possible in space. The intramolecular are the forces within the molecule, those bonds, covalent, polar covalent, and ionic. And these are much stronger forces. We're going to go starting with London dispersion forces, which are also known as Van der Waals forces. Some, sometimes I will write VDW for Van der Waals, and sometimes I will do IMF for intermolecular forces. So if you ever see IMF, I'm talking about an intermolecular force. Uh, possibly you'll at least see it in other notations as I'm writing through things fast. Yep. Yep. Um, does intermolecular forces mean specifically Van der Waals, or could also be like hydrogen? It's any of okay. those those ones. Good question. Yep. And if it says IMF, we'll it's intra. Intra. Yep. Yep. Okay. 
So these are forces between noble gases and nonpolar molecules. So if we think about those gas discharge tubes that we had, we had a neon gas tube. Okay, how can those neon molecules be held near to one another when there's no polarity to them? There's no partial positives or negatives anywhere. Well, it's because the noble gases and non-polar in an induced dipole moment. So for a very, very brief moment in time, the electrons will start to shift from one part of the, where it is around the atom, to another part. And that'll give it a partial positive in one area and a partial negative in the other. This is a very weak force. This is the weakest of our intermolecular forces. too far. So as we have two helium atoms here, as one comes near the other, we've got this two plus, that's the two protons in the nucleus, attracting the electron that's in this one, but it's pushing away the electrons from the other one. This is our momentary dipole. So we've got the nucleus attracting the electrons of this one to it, which is then pushing the electrons on this one further away. This is uh, not really a picture picture. It does, it does, but it's not. So we've got a partial negative with the electrons grouping over this way, the partial positives where the electrons are not around here so much, they're on the other side. So that's our momentary and this is happening if we've got a whole bunch of helium in a tube or in a balloon or whatever, there, this is happening all the time as atoms get close to one another and further away from one another. So it'll attract, but then the electrons will keep shifting because they're moving all the time. And then it'll go to another side and it'll start interacting with all of them. It's not just that we have two atoms in there. So we've got this on and on force where they're shifting the electrons around the nucleus. Yep. Does this happen every time two atoms be close to each other? Or this is one of the things that could happen, yes. Could happen or will happen? Could happen. Okay, so it's like a possibility. Yep. And the other possibilities are dipole, dipole, yep. and hydrogen? Yep. Okay. Yep. And, and even, I mean, there's got to be close enough for this to happen. If we've got two helium atoms in the room and everything else is... Only two? Yep, everything else is vacated from the room, they have to be close enough for this to start interacting with one another. If we've got where you are and where I am are two helium atoms, they're not going to interact and so they're just going to keep moving around the room until they do happen to get close enough by chance. Mm -hmm. Okay, dipole-dipole is our next one and this is with ones that have polar molecules. So we've got some dipole moment is what we call it. We've got a partial positive side and a partial negative side. So we're looking at polar covalent molecules. And all of these atoms are going to arrange themselves in such a way that they're going to maximize those attractive repulsion forces. So the positives are going to try to shift themselves closer to negatives. Negatives are going to try to shift themselves closer to positives. Positives are going to shift away from positives, so on and so forth, just like magnets. like the buckyball magnets, but not the buckyball carbon atoms that we were talking about before. But raise your hand if you've seen the buckyballs before. The magnets, not the buckyballs, is in the carbon. Okay, not the whole class. I'll bring in my buckyballs tomorrow so you can know what we're talking about when we're talking about the magnets. Hmm? No. I won't let any of you eat them. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Um, so, again, when we talk about buckyballs, if you see that on any test, that's talking about pure carbon. And it, as you read through the graphene, you should get a better idea of that. We're not talking about the buckyballs as the name of these magnetic balls that they've made and marketed. So don't get those confused. Yeah. 
Okay, dipole dipole attractions are gonna become weaker as the distances increase. Just like that helium example we were just talking about. The force is not there if they're not near one another. And the one that we see most often, an example in real life that we see most often with this dipole dipole attraction is water. Because we have polar molecules with water. Remember our hydrogen Mickey Mouse here. We've got electron clouds coming off here, making this end very negative. The hydrogens are going to be more positive. So we've got our positive side and our negative side. So here we go. Um, this is not looking specifically at water, but this is basically what's going on here. I've got my negative sides getting close to my positive sides. We've got attraction and repulsion going on everywhere. And they just orient themselves the best way possible. If you remember back to the very beginning of the school year, atoms and molecules are always moving. So these are always going to be moving around. Even those desks that seem so solid are made of atoms and molecules that are always moving. Yeah? Um, are positive and negative charges more attracted to one specifically? I mean, no, 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 I know like positive attracts negative. Yep. But, uh, for example, if, they, if a positive was only attracted to one negative at a time, that would cause like a straight line. Yep, yep. So, so are they, is every positive like equally attracted to two negatives? Not necessarily. So if, let's just look at this one here. This one is closer to this negative, so this line here would be a bigger attraction than this one as it's going from that positive to that negative. So the forces will all be different. And they, they move around so much that we don't get that nice linear thing. Okay. It, they're going to keep moving and, and interacting with one another. Right. Good question. What other questions do you have so far? So those are two of our intermolecular forces. Our next one is called hydrogen bonding. Now I didn't put this on the first slide because it confuses people. And I don't want you to be confused. It's called hydrogen bonding, but it's not actual bonding. You might want to make a note to yourself there. It is not an intramolecular bond. It's an intermolecular force. And it gets so confusing, and I don't want it to get confusing for you. It's not an actual bond. This is due to the higher electronegativity differences. So hydrogen is not all that electronegative. But when we bond it to um, nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, there's going to be a big electronegativity difference. And this is just a type of dipole-dipole bond that contains a hydrogen and a highly electronegative atom. So it's a stronger dipole-dipole intermolecular force. So again, we're looking at those positives and the negatives, and they're attracting the opposites and repelling the sames. And any time we have a molecule that has hydrogen bonded to oxygen and we have a bunch of these molecules interacting with one another we have a hydrogen bond and these highly electronegative ones that we're looking at are nitrogen oxygen and fluorine so a couple of ways that some of my previous students have uh, remembered that the hydrogens bonded to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine are things like hydrogen bonding is a NOF, 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 or hydrogen bonding is almost FON, because it's almost F-U-N if you go in the opposite direction. Any way that you can remember it is a good way to remember it. This is the strongest of our intramolecular forces. So let's look here. Let's say I have, maybe, come on. Oh, my board.
word is not working well today. There we go. So let's say I have hydrogen fluoride. And I've got a bunch of hydrogen fluorides together. So right here, this HF that I have, this is a bond. This is one of our intramolecular bonds. Okay, we've got a polar covalent molecule here. And I've got another polar covalent molecule here. And I've got another polar covalent molecule here. The hydrogen and fluorines are going to attract towards one another. And the fluorines and fluorines will try to get away from one another. Hydrogens and hydrogens are going to try to get away from one another. These lines in between are the hydrogen bonds, my intermolecular force. It's what's holding them near one another. And again, it's any time we see a dipole-dipole interaction where we've got a polar molecule, but we have to have a hydrogen fluorine bond, a hydrogen oxygen bond, or a hydrogen nitrogen bond. Otherwise, it's just a regular dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Yep. Are all these intermolecular, uh, not bonds? Forces, yep. Forces, yep. They all have to be between the same type of molecules, like these are all FH? Okay. Not necessarily. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, it could be all with the same if we're thinking of like a beaker of hydrogen fluoride then it would all be the same. But if we're thinking of just regular non-purified water where we have water and we have different ions in it, then we're dealing with these intermolecular forces and other stuff. That's an excellent way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. Would these bonds form a mathematical structure? Like, 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 a, like a shape? Like would, the, would they go, would they make a triangle? Because that would seem that, you know, like fluorine would be with the hydrogen, the hydrogen but it would still be far enough away from the other. Theoretically, but it would never be static because they are going to be moving quite a bit. Good, good point. Yep. Atoms are always moving. It's just a nature of the physics of it. Good question. And maybe the Higgs will finally tell us why. So, uh, here's an example of hydrogen bonding with water. So water, I said, was a dipole-dipole force, but even more than that, it's even stronger. It's a hydrogen bond because we have these oxygens, we've got the hydrogens, we've got the dipole-dipole force, but since